This year you will be lied to, and I want to try and protect you. This year you will hear a lot of talk about climate change, in conversation with friends and family, but also online and in mainstream media. Quite possibly in the context of the many elections taking place around the world this year. In this video I want to jump ahead of all that talk and warn you of some of the lies that you will be told this year. Because unfortunately, not everyone talking about the climate is doing so in good faith, accurately representing the science. In fact, there are many people out there who wish to deceive you for their own self-benefit. And without some contextual information about climate, they may well succeed. So I've pulled together a team of scientists, climate educators and activists to play a little game of Would I Lie To You About Climate Change? In this game I'm going to read you a statement and we'll hear from an expert about whether it's true or not. First up, Getting to net zero will be ruinously expensive, and we shouldn't do it. One of the myths about climate change that just refuses to die is that it's just too expensive to act against it. Now, firstly, lots of climate change solutions actually save us money, stuff like energy efficiency measures. But sure, decarbonizing the world's economy won't come for free. But this line of logic ignores one entire side of the equation, the costs of climate change. And if we can't afford climate action, what on earth would make you think we can afford climate change? The people saying it's too expensive to get to net zero make me think of a car salesperson telling you it's just way too expensive to have brakes on this car. And the thing is, stopping climate change provides loads of benefits besides just stopping climate change, from stimulating the economy to preventing millions of air pollution deaths. In fact, thanks to these huge benefits, one study found it would be worth the UK getting to net zero even if the rest of the world didn't bother. Next, a claim that will almost certainly feature in at least one presidential race. The impacts of climate change won't be harmful, and we don't have anything to worry about. To say that climate change won't have harmful impacts is outright incorrect. There's a huge document detailing the expected impacts of climate change, and they're not great. Take your pick from increased heat waves, greater ranges of tropical diseases, more extreme weather, and extinction of species. But these impacts are not evenly distributed. As a result, those in the global south who have contributed the least to this crisis are suffering the most from the dangers of climate impacts. The impacts of the climate crisis are not evenly distributed. While those in the global north who are responsible for around half of all emissions since the Industrial Revolution will suffer the least from climate impacts. When it comes to the climate crisis, it is crucial to recognize that the global south and the global north face different realities. To tackle global inequalities, we need to actively involve global south countries in decision-making spaces. Countries in the global north should also support the stronger inclusion of individuals from the global south in the climate space. So to say that we don't have anything to worry about is A, untrue, and B, depends on a very close-minded interpretation of we. You might be wondering, by the way, how I know you're going to hear these lies this year. And the reason is, while they may be new to you, they're definitely not new. People have been tracking misinformation about climate change online for a long time now. Skeptical Science, for example, is an excellent resource where scientists debunk claims and misconceptions about climate in easy to understand language. Hi, I'm John Cook. I'm a research fellow at the University of Melbourne, and I also started Skeptical Science way back now in 2007. At the moment, I'm in charge of updating the Skeptical Sciences rebuttals of which there are 200 odd. And the reason we need to do that is because the science keeps moving on. The basic idea of Skeptical Science is we debunk climate misinformation with peer-reviewed research. What we try to do with Skeptical Science is make all that research accessible, um, readable for people, understandable, so that they can hear a climate myth, go to Skeptical Science, and they can find an answer or, or a debunking of that myth in hopefully a way that is clear and easy to understand. For example, one claim that has been pushed by climate skeptics with increasing frequency in recent years is climate scientists can't be trusted and all their predictions have been wrong. We often hear the argument that climate scientists can't be trusted, that we're only in it for the money. Well, if so, then my check must still be in the post. 
Let me tell you, scientists could make a hell of a lot more money working for oil companies. I've been headhunted by enough insurance companies to know that my paltry scientist salary is only about a third of what's on offer in the corporate sector. The other claim is that scientists get predictions wrong all the time, but that's simply not true. Climate scientists have been saying for decades, if not centuries, that temperatures are going to rise along with emissions. And what's happened? temperatures have risen. And finally, people say that errors in our weather forecast is proof that we cannot predict climate change. But this misunderstands the difference between weather and climate. We actually understand the big picture, i.e. climate change, really, really well. And if we take everything into consideration, not least the chaos of the atmosphere, our weather prediction ability is extremely good. If it wasn't, well, you wouldn't have a weather forecasting app on your phone. And here's another claim that's very popular here in the UK at the moment. Heat pumps don't work when it gets cold. Ah, the old chestnut about heat pumps not working when it gets cold, eh? Well, I guess there's two ways of looking at it. There's the science boffin way, which explains the thermodynamic principle that energy is available right down to absolute zero on the Kelvin scale, which is minus 273 degrees on the Celsius scale. Heat pumps don't generate heat, they simply move thermal energy from one place to another. As long as there's energy in the environment, heat pumps can extract it, dump it into a fluid and send it through a heat exchanger to heat your water. That's why heat pumps don't need a fuel source like gas. And that's also why a heat pump can provide two or three times more thermal energy into your heating system than the electrical energy required to drive the process, even at sub-zero temperatures. Then there's the layman's answer, which is this. I live in an old Victorian semi-detached house I've had a heat pump for three years. Outside temperatures have dropped well below zero on many occasions in those three years. My thermostat is constantly set to 20 degrees Celsius. The inside of my house has stayed at 20 degrees Celsius 24-7, 365 without fail ever since I had the heat pump installed and it's costing me about the same to run as my old gas boiler did. Trust me, they work. As a side note, the country with the most heat pumps per capita is Norway, where, you know, it gets pretty cold. Now I can't go through every climate lie you'll probably hear this year because there are just so many. As I've already said, skeptical science is a great resource to point others to if they share a misconception or myth about climate. But if you hear something new that doesn't sound quite right, then Dr. Cook had some specific advice. The short answer is flick. F-L-I-C-C. -C. These are the five techniques of science denial. Fake experts, logical fallacies, impossible expectations, cherry picking and conspiracy theories. And learning the techniques of denial, those red flags, then help you to see them. And when you see posts, arguments, um, you know, someone on the media saying something or even in a conversation. A fake expert is someone who either has no expertise or irrelevant expertise. They may seem like an expert, but their expertise is actually in a different field to what they're talking about. So what you really want to look for when someone is appealing to their own authority and expertise is, are they actually a climate expert? Do they publish climate research? Where are they actually from? Often a cursory look will give you, will tell you all you need to know. Sometimes you've got to dig a little deeper, but it's just really being aware of that. Just have a second look and think, okay, that person's wearing a suit and sounds very strongly opinionated and confident, but are they an actual expert? Now let's tackle a big one. We shouldn't do anything about climate change because China isn't. Why should we try to address climate change when China's doing nothing? Well, first of all, the whole world really is taking steps to protect our planet. It just doesn't always make the headlines. And China actually added more solar power capacity in 2023 alone than any other nation has installed in their full history, which is pretty mind boggling. They're doing more too, like improving their air quality, which extends out to neighboring countries. Their emissions are on course to peak by 2025, and they even protected giant pandas to the point where their status was downgraded and they're no longer endangered. To be clear, they aren't doing nearly enough, but saying they're doing nothing is clearly not true. And while we continue to collectively demand action, the rest of the world is listening too. 175 nations have agreed to sign a binding agreement by the end of 2024 on ending plastic pollution. At least 86 nations agreed to the Global High Seas Treaty in 2023 to protect international waters. And renewable energy is now both cheaper and accounts for the vast majority of new power capacity being added around the world. And if you'd like to hear more good news about climate change, because there is plenty, you can check out Jacob's Instagram, or sign up for his newsletter, Climativity, or the Progress Playbook, or my own newsletter, or all three.
Why not? Unfortunately, there are lots of reasons why people lie about climate change. Sometimes it's ignorance. A lot of the time, though, it's because some people don't want the status quo, relying on fossil fuels and polluters not being regulated, to change. Usually because they are profiting from that status quo, and will even explicitly call for a lack of action using statements like, getting to net zero will be harmful to the world's poorest. If the 57 companies responsible for 80% of carbon emissions since 2016 continue to spend millions lobbying government to pass on the costs of their harmful behaviour to the everyday person, and if the green energy transition continues to be powered by oppressive, genocidal and unsustainable mining practices, getting to net zero will be harmful for the poorest community. But we can get to net zero in a way that maximises the benefits and minimises the harms by implementing a just transition, where our policies and actions are informed by climate justice. This looks like building in economic benefits to green switches, investing in a green jobs revolution with guaranteed living wages, health benefits, training and proper workplace safety, investing in local solutions that build resilience for local communities and connecting green improvements. You will almost certainly be fed dozens and dozens of lies and half-truths about climate change this year, and this video could go on forever. But to round us off, one final claim that you will hear this year, it's not too late for us to solve the climate problem. Don't be fooled. The situation with our changing climate is undoubtedly pretty catastrophic, but every single thing that every single one of us can do, either individually or at local, regional or national or even global level, will be essential for making the future of our children and grandchildren less catastrophic than it would be if we listened to Big Oil's propaganda machine. Every fraction of a degree of warming makes a difference, and every fraction of a degree of warming we can avoid saves lives. It's not yet enough, but as a planet and as a connected people, we are pushing forward everywhere. So wouldn't you rather make your slice of the world as great as it can be, show off how lovely it is to live in harmony with our environment, and make everyone else realize how much better things can be? You may think your efforts will announce are no more than a drop in the ocean, but oceans are made up of drops, and if we all act collectively, things will change. The nature of the climate crisis is cumulative. It's never too late to bend the curve and make the future better. It's not too late for us to fix this problem. In pulling together a video like this, I have to strike a balance. Make the video comprehensive enough, but also give it a length and a pace that will perform on YouTube. And something that I wanted to include, but I couldn't because it would have tipped the balance, was an extended discussion with the guys from Skeptical Science about how they are evolving our understanding of climate misinformation online. And I'm not alone. Many educational YouTubers wish that they could put more substance into their videos, but worry about deviating from the duration and the format that finds algorithmic success on YouTube. So much so that they, and that includes me, have created a whole new streaming service where that isn't a consideration. It's where I've uploaded my discussion with John and John on Nebula. This video forms part of a library of extra content from me on Nebula, including extended interviews with experts, whole new videos, and an entire course on my approach to scientific filmmaking that you can find nowhere else. And I'm just one of over 200 creators who upload to Nebula, offering early access and exclusive videos. The reason we creators made this new service is to take ownership of how our videos get distributed, freeing us from the limitations of a giant company like like YouTube, and changing how those videos get funded. We don't like adverts, so Nebula doesn't have any. Instead, Nebula operates on a subscription model, with your monthly or annual subscription being split between those creators that you watch, with a portion also going towards financing new projects like feature films and documentaries. We're actually also offering lifetime memberships at the moment to finance those bigger projects. One payment, and then you're set for as long as both you and we exist. If you would like a better viewing experience with no adverts, watching exclusive content and directly supporting us creators, 
then we'd love to have you on board. You can pick up a subscription at go.nebula.tv slash Simon Clark, links below. And if you use my link, you'll get a 40% discount on a subscription. That link again for a better, more comprehensive viewing experience was go.nebula.tv slash Simon Clark. The scientists, educators, and activists you've been hearing from throughout this video all do incredible work on climate, and I've linked them all down there in the description. I actually join many of them on the Peak Action Climate Creators to Watch list this year, which was an absolute delight, an unexpected honor. There's a link to that down there in the description as well, where you can find out even more about even more activists. Thank you to my collaborators for this video, but also thank you to my wonderful patrons over on patreon.com forward slash Simon Oxfizz. These names on screen right now are my executive producer patrons. You can join them if you would like the sound of getting exclusive behind the scenes content every month, early access to videos, and voting on a video topic a month. It's not an exaggeration to say that these people have completely revolutionized how I do my job. So if you're seeing your name up there, thank you very much. If you'd like to join them, please consider signing up as well. Link down there in the description. If you enjoyed the video, please do consider sharing it on your socials or in a group chat so that we can get this information out there and pre-bunk climate misinformation. You can also do the YouTube pleasantries, leaving a comment, leaving a like, all that good stuff. And that just leaves me to say thank you again for watching. If you'd like to watch something else, here's two videos I prepared earlier. Thank you. I'll see you in the next one.